Great, like, like a good teacher, you just start talking and everyone will hopefully follow in suit um, and settle down. Um, so thanks again um, to all of our, our in, important morning speakers. Uh, we're so glad that Chris Nacetta is still here with us. I know Bill is still here as well. Um, and again, we've just been delighted that you're all to join us. And now um, that we've heard even more about what's in the index itself, and we've teed up a little bit about what we hope the index can do and how different stakeholders will use it, uh, it is my very, very distinct pleasure to turn the floor over, if you will, to my very dear friend and, and very uh, dear friend and colleague, Dan Rundy. Uh, Dan is uh, a huge supporter of, of, youth, of the Youth Initiative. Um, he helped get it launched here as part of the project he runs, a project on prosperity and development. He's the Schreier Chair in Global Analysis here at CSIS. And again, I'm just thrilled that he's able to be uh, part, of this, uh, part of this event today. Uh, our other distinguished speakers um, today include uh, we've introduced earlier Anga Marta. He is the youth advocate for the United Nations Population Fund in Indonesia and was a very um, welcome and insightful contributor to uh, our development process. Um, thrilled to have as well Ambassador Ibrahim Rasool. He's the South African ambassador to the United States. Uh, to his right, Carla Capel. Uh, wonderful to see Carla here as my former colleague at USAID. Uh, she is currently the Chief Strategy Officer at the US Agency for International Development. And again, we're, we're thrilled she's here. To her right, Manny Jimenez uh, is the Director of Public Sector Evaluations an independent evaluation group at the World Bank. And as uh, has been mentioned earlier, he was also the, the lead author for the seminal 2007 World Development Report, Development in the Next Generation. Um, and as well as with Anga was an important uh, contributor with us in our Global Experts Review. So we're very glad that he can share his thoughts with us today. And last but most certainly not least, at the end of the table, we have Lori Harnick. She's the General Manager for Citizenship and Public Affairs of the Microsoft Corporation, and we're really thrilled um, that she, along with everyone else, can be here today. With that, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, this is really uh, very exciting to be here, uh, to be participating in this conversation about the, uh, the Global Youth Wellbeing Index. I see this as sort of the mother of all conversation starters. This is the mother of all icebreakers for policymakers, for business people, for philanthropy, for the nonprofit sector, for local governments. And I think it's very, it's gonna be, I think we'll have a chance to unpack how different uh, stakeholders uh, see the Global Youth Wellbeing Index from their perspectives in this panel that, that we're gonna be talking about. But the one thing I wanna just highlight though uh, is something that uh, my friend Don Terry, who used to run the Multilateral Investment Fund, quoting, Ronald Reagan said that the best social program is a job. And so my big takeaway from the, from the, from the data in the index is that the best social program is a job and that uh, if we need to be doing better on, the, on economic opportunity, and I think that was highlighted in the previous panel, uh, we need to be thinking about that, of course, as well as the other domains, that's the technical term that we use to talk about the other sectors. Um, but absolutely, we need to make sure that people are, are uh, fully employed and participating uh, in, a, in a constructive way in the economy. I'm gonna start first uh, with uh, my colleague, Anga, who's flown in all the way from Indonesia to be with us. And Anga, uh, you're the, you represent the youth on the panel, if you will, and, uh, but, uh, in the, but how, how do you think your peers should and will use the index is one question for you. And you've also been active in the post-2015 MDG, Millennium Development Goal conversations. How do you think this index will or should inform the debate and future of the MDG, something we've been talking about and, and working on here at CSIS as well? Thank you, Dan. Uh, indeed, I'm a youth. Uh, hi, hi, guys. My name is Anga. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, come from Indonesia. I'm a youth advocate for UNF Indonesia. It's a unique uh, job opportunity for young people like me. I'm 23 years old, anyway. Um, is a kind of like, um, you know, a connector between young people with United Nations system as well as government of Indonesia. Uh, regarding your question, I think uh, this index uh, give a very good set of uh, evidence base for young people to continue their advocacy. Because uh, if we're talking about the post-2015 development agenda, one thing missing that based on youth perspective is actually the idea of what are the youth problem is, 
And I think this index can give a very general, uh, you know, a set of uh, identification of a problem. And then as young people, we can say to our government or we can say to other, uh, you know, uh, uh, sectors like private sector, civil society, and also other sectors saying that this is our problem. And the second thing that I would like to say is actually that based on this index, we can clearly see that this is the time when young people is no longer a subject for development. This is a time where young people is a partner for development. This is a time for young people to become a subject, to work together with other stakeholders to create a better world. So I think um, this is a very, uh, you know, uh, I forgot the other word, but this is very useful for young people to, to, to know about this index and to advocate, to continue their advocacy, to ensuring that the post-2015 development agenda uh, include young people inside and as well as other stakeholders also consider us as, as a partners. So I think that's then. Great. Thank you. A ambassador Rasul, you're the ambassador, uh, the South African ambassador of the United States. South Africa does extremely well in the citizen participation domain. It's ranked second but shows room for improvement in other domains. How do you think a government can use the index to address youth well-being in their respective countries? In your experience, have you, how have you seen policy reform in reaction to other types of indices, such as the doing business indicators, for example? No, thank you very much. And maybe just to latch on to where Anger left it off, I want to say that um, it's very, very critical to have a dashboard that, in a sense, disaggregates what is generally seen as the youth challenge. Mm -hmm. And especially on a continent like Africa where almost 50% of the world's population under the age of 35 will soon be residing there, I think what we need is not a general description, but I think a very tactile, targeted one that says, how are we doing on this, how are we doing on that, and how are we doing on that? And that's an enormous strength, I think, of the idea of an index. I think as South Africa, of course, we'd have liked to be the index not to be a snapshot but a movie so that you can see where it comes from, where it is now, and where it's going to, as opposed to this disaggregated snapshot that describes a set of indicators and ranks you, for example, 23rd. Because if HIV is a big driver of health, the health domain, then it may show where you are in for example, infection rates, but it won't show that you've reached the summit and that you're plateauing. Um, if that is the only disease indicator, it won't show what you've done with malaria, what you've done with malnutrition, what you've done with kwashiorkor, because it doesn't get into the, into the conversation. And so I think if secondary enrollment, secondary school enrollment is your indicator, then we feel a bit cheated because we've just reached universal primary um, <laughs> enrollment in South Africa. So I think that we would have preferred a movie as opposed to a, a snapshot. But I think that we've got to live with it as it is, and thank God that we've got a very high youth participation because the point is, again, the continuum that Anger has provided, which I will add to, are youth the subjects of development partners in development or recipients of development. And I think that with a high youth participation index, a faith in democracy, a faith in the rule of law, a working relationship with government, sometimes antagonistic, sometimes complementary, the situation of institutions, a policy base to deal with youth, um, financial resources to tackle the youth issues, I think you have a better rate, a better possibility of making not only participants, but drivers of, um, of, a, of, a, of, of a youth wellness or well-being um, set of, 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 of things going forward. And, and that, I think, is that sometimes you can have a, jo a, a, a job without a voice. And maybe what has carried us through the dark years of apartheid, in the absence of jobs, in the absence of participation, in the absence of even government assistance was a voice. And a voice, I think, carries you through some of the worst times and ensures that the rest will come. So, 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 so that's something that I do want to say. I think that what the snapshot also misses is a very important distinction. 
in a situation where we don't simply have an unemployment problem, but an unemployability problem, where, the, where we have made our transition from apartheid to democracy over the last 20 years, the world has made a transition from an industrially-based society to a knowledge-driven society. And when generations of black South Africans have not received any education in math and science, they are effectively disabled from participation in it. And so what we have done with a functionally unemployment youth, unemployable youth bulge was to complement what could be achieved through an economic wage participation in a private sector driven economy with a social wage. G cash grants, for example, when you're under the age of 18. Free healthcare, free water, free electricity in order to keep the wolves away from the door, and a school, a, a universal school nutrition program that I think fortifies against malnutrition. And so when the bottom has fallen out of your world, I think that there's a safety net that actually manages. And, 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 and those are some of the issues that are missing. The last point that I think we need to be able to do is in our second transition, going into our next 20 years, we understand the need to be a bit more regulatory with a risk-averse banking sector because where there's no experience in work, where there's no collateral um, against which to lend, you need less risk-averse financial institutions, and that's going to become a policy area in order to get us away from number 30. I think um, we, 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 we need to be able to understand what are, on that dashboard, what are the kind of regulatory buttons that I think we need to be able to overcome youth um, unemployment and unemployability, what are the kind of policy buttons that we need to be able to put, what are the practical things, how do we expand, for example, our public works program to give a base for experience of which the private sector can feel more comfortable hiring. So I think using that dashboard approach, this index actually positions us to understand better how to move forward. I've taken a bit more time, but thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Carla Kopel, uh, you are USAID's uh, Chief Strategy Officer. USAID's been investing in youth development for decades, and at the end of 2012, released its first ever youth, uh, youth uh, policy on youth in development. How do you think the agency and the broader USG can or will use this index to inform its strategy and elevate youth uh, as, as you think about uh, achieving your mission of ending extreme poverty? Also, in a past life, you had a role uh, thinking, uh, working on gender issues within USAID. There's this, the issue of gender has come up uh, in the previous panel. Uh, could you talk a little bit about putting that, that, looking at it through that lens? And then finally, you've also had a, a, a career thinking about security as well. And so if you could also just give us that as well, all in three minutes or less. Right? So, <laughs> so. No, but take, take, take a few minutes to I'm on unpack it. that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, and thank you for including me today, and congratulations on the creation and release of the index. We, as you mentioned, released the policy in 2012 under the uh, stewardship and with shepherding by Nicole Golden. So I always love colleagues who identify things like data gaps and then go on to fill them. Um, so she's completing uh, the beginning of work that I know is uh, part of a career and a passion for her. Uh, so personal congratulations to you. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the comments that have been made to date because I think that there really are different perspectives on why this index is useful. And I was thinking as the first two speakers were talking how different my thinking was from an AID perspective on, on what this index does for us. We use indices in a number of ways, um, and I wanted to highlight uh, four that immediately occur to me. I mean, first of all, as I alluded to, there's an incredible gap in the data and evidence um, with regard to the status of youth writ large and, and what is working where and, and how to chart a path forward. And this is one critically important tool for enabling us to do a better job as we design, implement, and evaluate uh, interventions. And I won't talk any more about evaluation because I'm sure you'll focus on that. Um, the second thing I think it shows us is really related to the trends and where we see uh, trends that are moving in positive or negative directions and what the implications of those are. Uh, and I think the ambassador spoke beautifully to the way that reflects within one country context and then to broaden out from that country context to others. 
um, and to really enable that comparison and contrast, which is uh, a, another really important way to um, use an index and to think where there are similarities, where there are differences, where there is progress, <laughs> where there is a lack of progress. Um, and then for us to use in looking at how we're making progress and in our interventions. And, and this isn't USAID alone, although we certainly want to understand where we can either attribute gains to the work we're doing or where we are contributing uh, to positive progress or indeed negative trends and to try to um, address those as we move forward over time. So I see enormous applicability and utility to this as we move forward um, in a multiplicity of ways. Um, it's interesting, with regard to my work on gender issues, um, there are a number of ways this plays out. Uh, from, a, from the perspective of looking at an index, we face very similar kinds of challenges with regard to data um, when we're looking at gender issues as to when we're looking at um, issues related to youth and, and sex disaggregated data and how you think about filling those data gaps in ways that give you the actual answers in terms of the interventions you seek. Um, so there's that, that piece related to um, the analytical frame that you use to move forward and you see a lot of similarities when you think about uh, gaps in data. Um, then you look at the challenges that youth face and how different those challenges are uh, if you are male or if you are female. Um, in terms of the cultural constraints you face, whether that is uh, as it relates to your expectations if you are a male or if you're a female, uh, what you are uh, allowed to do um, within your society, uh, the extent to which you are being educated, and, and uh, the ambassador was talking about gaps in education in elementary and middle school education, and we see that play out very clearly uh, with regard to the enormous gaps in, in the transition from primary to secondary education for girls. Um, but we also see how um, male youth are falling behind in certain parts of the world with implications for security and stability. Uh, and I was just meeting yesterday with a group of Pakistani uh, women leaders who were talking about the issues with actually uh, males falling behind within the education system and how that has implications for countering violent extremism um, and stability within the Pakistani context. So uh, the spillover from uh, the multiple things you asked me to cover, Dan, in my three minutes. Um, and I think that what we ultimately, when you talk about uh, gender issues, whether you're talking about security, um, and conflict, it really comes down to the same question, is whether you're looking at a demographic dividend and how you um, harvest the potential and the possibility in the youth that are uh, in many societies around the world today, or if you're looking at a youth bulge that you have to manage and deal with that brings with it instability, uh, dysfunction, and the potential for uh, economic decline. And we can talk more as we take the conversation forward, but um, I think there are there's a very rich conversation to be had in any of these areas, and I think that this index provides us an incredibly strong foundation for carrying those those conversations forward with a foundation of knowledge, information, and data that's essential to really an informed debate. So thank, thank, you, thank you, Carla. Now I understand why you're the chief strategy officer at USA. That was great. Thank you very much. Very helpful, um, Manny. Thanks for being here. You were the lead author of the World Bank's 2007 seminal work, on the World Development Report that focused on youth, and people have cited it here, and I know it's been cited ever since it was published and continues to be the gold standard on, on youth development, and obviously we, we think we're helping to contribute to that conversation here as well. But think about um, how has the conversation evolved since 2007, and can you talk a little bit about how you see the index advancing the conversation both broadly, but also within the, the bank group. Thanks very much, uh, Dan. I don't know if your metaphor of this being the mother of all conversation st starters makes me the grandmother, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm a very proud, uh, pr <laughs> a very proud grandparent in that case to uh, to Nicole and her team's excellent uh, excellent work. Um, uh, but I think that uh, one of the things I, I just want to reflect on is uh, 
Um, I wish we had had this index, and, and Bill remembers the early conversations in the WDR, uh, World Development Report, uh, when uh, we started that work. Because one of the things I think that uh, uh, this index does uh, is to start the conversation not with uh, the people who are already committed to youth development, but to the economic policy makers who really thought this was a niche social issue as opposed to really essential to how economies develop in, uh, in, in all countries. And, and that conversation we tried to uh, uh, inculcate in the WDR 2007, and I'm so pleased that we're able to continue that conversation and remind those people who are coming next week to the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, the finance ministers, the planning ministers, the governors of the central bank, that youth development is essential, not just for youth, but to the whole country. And I think that's going to be still a continuing uh, conversation. Uh, the other thing is, I, I, I gather that in the earlier uh, 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 session, um, uh, you talked a lot about jobs and economic empowerment, and Dan, Dan, you mentioned that. And that's what I see, actually, in the past several years, perhaps precipitated by the Arab Spring, uh, where uh, the conversation uh, has gone, and where this, is going to be, this index is going to play a really key role. Because, again, Harding, talking back on my other point, uh, about the need to have these intersectoral linkages. I think what this index does is to say, yes, it's important to have jobs, okay? But jobs is also not a niche topic. That jobs for youth depend on the education that young people have, their health, okay? uh, and uh, their access to ICT and all the other dimensions that this report mentions. Not to mention the very important aspect that Anga raised, which is to bring the youth perspective into account. Uh, we, as older uh, uh, people who design policy, often forget to, uh, or do not do enough of the consultation with the ultimate beneficiaries, which are young people. And the third thing, because Carl baited me on, uh, on this, uh, is uh, about evaluation. I think one of the things that uh, I see going forward, uh, Dan, is a, really, a real hunger for, okay, once we're convinced, what works? What actually works to help uh, uh, young people and economic, uh, and economic development in these countries? And that I see as the, uh, the, the boundary uh, of where we have to go. And I, again, I, I think this index puts us a step in that direction. Thanks very much. Laurie Harnick, thanks for coming in from Seattle to be with us. You're with Microsoft. And the, one of the things that is that ICT is quickly becoming or already is the central nervous system for the world's youth. Uh, what are your thoughts about how ICT was included in the index and the findings in this area and its implications, but also how, more broadly, how should the private sector be thinking about the findings of this index? Uh, thank you very much, and it's a real honor to be here today. Um, I'll answer a few of those questions, perhaps in different order, if you don't mind. Um, when I look at the report and the index, there are three things that strike me as really wonderful about it. Um, first of all, I am thrilled that we started the morning with opening comments about investment, investment in a resource. Um, youth is the best investment we can all make in the future. So. The fact that, that we started the conversation by looking at it as a resource to invest in, I think is absolutely critical and it's absolutely wonderful. I'm so glad we did that. The second is I'm really glad that the index looked at something called the positive youth development, uh, looking at development from an opportunity perspective, uh, not just seeing the challenges, but seeing the opportunity to invest wisely in young people and in our future. So um, from that perspective, uh, this is where Microsoft comes in. We, uh, a year and a half ago, created a initiative called the, the Youth Spark Initiative. And we did that based on a report that we did with IYF called Opportunity for Action. Um, it was all about looking at the challenges young people are facing around the world and seeing how we can help. And what was interesting about that report, as Bill mentioned earlier, 
is the root cause of the challenges facing young people are very different. Those root causes are very different depending on the country, the number of factors that are here in the index and otherwise. But unfortunately, the outcome is quite similar, meaning the challenge is great that they face. And so we created the Youth Spark Initiative at Microsoft to look at ways of creating opportunity for young people for education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And clearly one of those paths, not the only, but one of those paths is through access to technology. And so we made a commitment over a number of years to create opportunity for hundreds of millions of young people through our grants to nonprofits that are serving those youth around the world, through our products, our services, and our solutions. And the third aspect of the report that I quite appreciate is the importance of bringing the youth voice into the conversation. Um, in my role, I have an opportunity to meet with young people all around the world that we are working with and that we are helping. And I will tell you that despite all the challenges that we see and we discuss, the opportunity, the optimism that they see is just truly inspirational. Um, it, you know, it turns you into a believer immediately. And so this idea of how we can harness the energy and the ideas and the passion of, our, of young people today and look to them to help create the solutions with help from others, I think is just a wonderful uh, way forward. The last thing I'll just say, because Dan asked me to comment on, in terms of ICT in this index, um, I think what the index does is it, it shows us the tip of the iceberg. Um, what, what the index does, because it was looking to address what can be measured at scale, um, it shows us that there's a lot more to learn about ICT and what it can do to empower young people and to empower those who want to help young people um, and, the, and build the future. Um, I think what uh, one key takeaway that I have when I look at the data and I look at the, the material is that, yes, we are understanding somewhat access to internet, access and use of technology at a base level, but what we're not yet seeing and where we frankly are putting a lot of our effort is how do we help young people throughout their development that Bill mentioned earlier, from early childhood on to young adulthood, how do we help them through technology to build the skills that they will need for the jobs of today and tomorrow? Moreover, not just the use of technology, but how do we help young people access education so that they can understand how to create technology, so they can become the innovators that we all need for tomorrow, creating not only jobs in the technology industry, but jobs in all industries. And um, the, the new businesses, the new ventures that are gonna create and drive the economic growth that we're all looking for and that we're all counting on. So those are my thoughts on the index, and I just wanna congratulate Hilton and CSIS and IYF for shedding light on some really, really important information. Thank you very much. I thought um, that was particularly helpful, taking the data and, and, and drawing a conclusion from a private sector perspective. I, just Carla's comment about, are we looking at this as a demographic dividend, or are we looking at this as a youth bul bulge as a, as a challenge? I, I'm wondering if, if some of the other panelists might just speak to, when you look at the data from your, from your different stakeholder perspective, what, what's the action step or the conclusion that, that you draw from it to move in the direction of demographic dividend as opposed to moving towards youth bulge? And I'm wondering if, Carla, I might start with you, and then I'm also, but I'm also hearing, I think, Ambassador, to some extent, some of your comments reflected on that a little bit earlier, but if I might go back to you and Anga as well as Manny and then Lori, if you had other, any other comments, but if you could just think about, I think that frame, I think is the critical frame, which is, are we looking at this as an opportunity? Are we looking at this as a challenge? And it is both, but what is the, what's the action step or from, as you look at this data, and obviously you've only seen this for the last couple of days, so we won't hold you to it, but in, in terms of what was, what's your first impression about, okay, what's the, when you look at this, what does it say to you from your perspective in terms of a, a specific action step, step that's needed? Carla, I'll ask you to go first. Sure, thank you for the question. I, um, so for me, the, the first action step is a really 
obvious one because we are having our Global Mission Directors Conference coming up in May. And when we actually surveyed the mission directors, uh, among the top three issues that they identified for a focus was on youth development and investment. Um, and so that was a real indicator for us of the thirst that's there for this kind of conversation. Um, and what's interesting is it's really from a, very much from the bottom up. So what are the heads of our field offices saying are the things around which they want to wrap their minds and really think together collectively. Um, and so the, the index is a real tool, but the other is how do you think about this in a more comprehensive way? And we have a number of really standout programs around the world that are um, multifaceted and work with youth, whether that's Yes, yes Youth Can in, in Kenya or whether that's Alerta Joven in the Dominican Republic. And what we need to think about is what how do you overlay those successful multi-sectoral programs uh, with the data and see whether those are scalable and replicable in other places? And, and how do you then chart a path forward on the basis of um, the lessons learned from that experience on the ground? Yeah, Carla, thanks for drawing that. I, when I think about the challenges of youth, it's multi-sector approaches. And I think our friends at IYF, our friends at Hilton, AID, certainly think in those terms when they're thinking about youth, that this is not something one sector on its own can do. The private sector on its own can't do it. Official donor sector can't do it, whether it's the World Bank or AID. Governments on their own can't do it. The UN system necessarily on its own can't do it. It's a, it's a multi-sector approach. I think that's the other thing I certainly, as I'm listening to this conversation, I'm taking away, away from this. Anga, I'm, I'm wondering if you might comment on, on the question I had about this. How do, from where you sit in the, in the UN system, but also, could I also just probe you just a little bit further about this issue of the MDGs? Because the high level panel report that came out about nine months ago talked about youth as sort of a cross cutting issue. There wasn't necessarily a goal, and there may be difficult to actually create a goal for youth. Maybe there will be a goal for youth, maybe there won't, but just the way they were sort of showing their cards, they were sort of saying they saw this as a cross cutting issue. How, how is, as you're participating in these conversations about the MDGs, how is this coming up? But then come back to my question about, as well about this issue of how, how from as you look at this data, What's, what are the steps that the UN system could be or should be taking to think about youth as a demographic dividend as opposed to a youth bulb challenge? Thank you, Dan. Um, on regards to the post-2015 development agenda, indeed, they, um, but I think there's also a big um, achievement there while the high-level panel of eminent person already consider young people in the report as stakeholders. And they're also saying that, you know, you have to talk to young people because this is the future that they will live on. And I also think with this report, we can, you know, this, this one will be a really uh, nice, what uh, many, many say is like a standing foundation for us to advocate more on the youth involvement and also youth uh, goals in post-2015 development agenda. In UNFPA itself, uh, we are uh, starting to advocate the uh, standalone goals on youth in post-2015 development agenda because we think that uh, you know, protecting the human rights and meeting the development requirements, uh, you know, of all adolescents and youth is so important, considering that the quarter of the world population are youth and adolescents. Also, we, we think that, you know, the post-2015 development agenda have to uh, got involvement from young people, not only in the implementation process, but also in the evaluation and monitoring process. Uh, one thing that I will, uh, you know, I, I want to talk uh, on this forum is actually when we saw the video at the beginning of this uh, seminar, we saw that there are 1.8 billion young people on this planet. I just want to, to like to say that, don't just think that as a number. I would like all people here to think 1.8 billion as 1.8 billion opportunity, 1.8 billion dreams, and 1.8 billion hopes. That it really depends on how all stakeholders are working together to push these young people, to, to invest this, to, to, to young people, to make them realize their full, full potentials. Um, last, I think uh, there, there's a very good quote from uh, the former presidents in Indonesia, uh, the first president, Sukarno, when he said in General Assembly, he's saying, and I quote, that give me a thousand old men 
old man, and I will pull the mountain from its root. But give me ten young people, and I will change the world. So I think that's all. Thank you. Ambassador, uh, think, uh, thinking about this issue of how do we change it from a demographic dividend to a youth bulge, you were talking about the, the great progress that South Africa has made and it, that not necessarily is fully reflected in, in the data. Um, but, but talk about from a government perspective, what is, when you look at this data, in addition to sort of a reaction in terms of in that, it, it, it certainly that it reflects some, some, some progress and, and some, some gaps, but what, what, when you think of the gaps, where are the, where's, the, where's the opportunity for government to, to, um, to, to make change? No, thanks very much. I think that the one thing that I am able to discern from the data is really that we shouldn't treat all 30 states that have been surveyed as being equal. I think that there are some who are highly democratic, some who are highly authoritarian, yeah. some who are transitional states like South Africa moving from one to the other, and they all have different ways in which governments and global agencies need to be able to respond. If I take South Africa as a, as a transitional state, then we are able to use our resources to achieve certain quantitative goals. Build schools, get everyone into school, build health facilities, get people close to it, etc. And those quantitative goals can be very consuming and you could be missing the qualitative goals. What happens with the quality of education? And I think that those are the real kind of important things that I think we need to overlay on the quantitative goals almost immediately, and someone often has to come and assist with regard to that. But I think it's also about making targeted interventions. And so we, for example, have seen a cellular revolution across Africa that is laying the basis for entrepreneurship, because people use the handheld device to just transact almost anything, even an advance on the banking system of the United States. I think the award, for example, of the Square Kilometer Array Telescope to South Africa and seven other African states has created about six schools of astronomy across the continent, and now people's eyes have been lifted to the heavens, and that's driving their educational choices. And so it's, it's, it's being able to see this youth opportunity, but to understand what do you need to do in order to give them an aspiration. And not just an aspiration, but the wherewithal needs to be put down um, for it. So I, 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 I really think that it's not just a whole of government approach, but it's a whole of society approach. And I think that we need, in transitional states, a lot more from the private sector um, and from donor agencies um, to help us um, navigate, I think, this, these sets of transitions that we've got to make. Manny and Lori, if you could each just briefly re reflect on this question of what's the What's your takeaway from the data? And Laura, you really did answer that, I think, in your previous your statement. But if you had additional comments, I'd welcome them. But Manny, you first, if you would. Uh, thanks. Just uh, three reflections. Uh, uh, I think what the report is really good at is uh, articulating the challenges that policymakers and the private sector have to focus on. And and, and one is, uh, I think that. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the league table of the aggregate is interesting. I think it'll get you a lot of press. But to me, what's really interesting is how the differences across the different domains. So you have Colombia, for example, great in participation, very low on uh, economic opportunity. Japan is the exact opposite. And to me, that is absolutely fascinating as to what should policymakers really be focusing on. Uh, the second is, I think there's also a distinction that the report really helpfully makes, that when you take the youth perceptions into account, some of the rankings change for the countries, including my own from the Philippines. And I'd be very concerned that we may do well on the, uh, some of the indicators of education and health, but when you take how poor, for how young people feel about that, the, act, the ranking actually lowers. And again, there, there's a lot of room to be had to have the conversations on consultations. And, and, and the last thing is integrated policies and programs that uh, you all mentioned. And I think how, this is a, an enormous challenge and that um, 
getting the uh, youth programs not just to be owned by the Minister of Youth, if such one exists, but by the Ministers of Economics, but also Health, Education, Justice, and everyone else is a challenge. Laura, any further comments? Uh, yeah, in terms of, you know, next steps that I would see, things that we're thinking about and how, this, how those dovetail with this index. Um, first of all, I think on the uh, topic of multi-sector engagement, um, that is something that we believe very strongly in when we work in the over 100 countries where Microsoft operates around the world and approach societal challenges like youth unemployment and overall youth development, um, working with nonprofits, working with government, working with our colleagues, our customers, our business partners is absolutely critical. One of the things that we did this year is we convened a group called our Youth Spark Advisors, and this is bringing in the heads of our uh, nonprofit partners together to talk across the world around the issues and how we as a company can invest more wisely in helping them serve the young people that they are seeking to serve. Also hearing from them, what are those true challenges? The second area is um, measurement. We, um, I think it was um, Chris who said the importance of measurement and understanding from a business perspective what is the impact. So this index is excellent in giving us uh, another lens into looking at impact. When we look at ICT and that being an area to further understand as we talk with our nonprofits in the coming year, we are gonna be looking at building into our grant process tighter and tighter measurement of outcomes. So how, how is the training that you have provided help somebody get a job or start an enterprise? What's been the true impact on a young person's life? We'll be looking to gather that through our nonprofit partners, but also through young people themselves. And this is the third point, which is, um, about the importance of youth and their engagement in this entire process. Uh, just this week, we launched something called the Youth Spark Hub, uh, and it is a place where young people can come to find resources, ideas, connections, uh, programs where they can create and seize opportunities for themselves and for others. And this is something where we hope to learn directly from them what is it that's working? What can we do better? How can we help? And so um, I think that's, it, those are the areas of sort of metrics, engagement, multi-sector approach, um, engagement with youth, and, and metrics and understanding what can really make that impact. And frankly, as a company, just continuously learning and evolving our approach. Thanks very much, Lori. Let's go to some questions. We've got microphones. Uh, who's got questions or comments from the audience? Is that the woman in the back row there, and uh, gentleman in the red shirt, and woman back there? That we'll take those three. Yes. Yes. Um, Elena Suarez from the Inter American Development Bank. I manage the bank's youth program. I wanted to go back to the issue that you addressed about the need for integrated policies and programs. I think this uh, index is extremely helpful to see where where the gaps are, where the greatest challenges are. But it always seems that we end up in the same place, that we need integrated programming, integrated policies and strategies. Um, so I just wanted your thoughts, um, especially my uh, colleague and counterpart at the World Bank. You know, why is that such a challenge? Um, you know, politics aside, um, why can't we do, first of all, where are the best practices? Where do we go to find the best practices on integrated programming? And your thoughts on, you know, why, you know, why can't we turn this around? Um, you know, we've been at it, many of us in the field have been at it for many years, and we always end up in the same place. So your thoughts and reflections on that so would be interesting. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll gather the questions and then I'll ask the panelists to respond. Sir, in the red shirt. Hi, um, Brian Harris with IPS News. Um, so the index covers 30 countries. Um, I was wondering for the other countries that have not been covered in the index, um, how can the index guide um, implementation of youth development programming in uh, those countries that don't have specific data in the index? 
And then this question over here. Hello, I'm Barbara Simmons. I'm with Tubman University in Liberia, and I want to congratulate CSIS on this and the others. Um, my question would be, this seems to be a perfect way to um, do public, private, academic kind of partnerships. How can we all work together to further um, build on this? Okay, I'm going to ask Manny and Carla to respond to the woman from the IDB, and then I'm actually going to ask Nicole, or if someone else wants to from the panel respond, but I might ask Nicole to respond to the specific question about the, the, the countries not in the 30. And then on this issue of partnerships and how do we operationalize this, I might ask each of the other panelists to talk about how, how, do, we, how do we work across sectors and, and from your perspective, and maybe that may be a way to, to do this. Manny, why don't you go first and then Carla, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, it, Getting integrated programs and policies together is a challenge not just for countries but even for organizations like my own where uh, we're now undergoing an organization to try to get us to work out of our regional silos and, and silos is maybe it's just human nature. Uh, but I think that uh, the challenge is actually for a multidimensional issue like youth, how to get on with that. And, and, and one thing that I know uh, Bill and, and IYF and, and Hilton have, have uh, uh, studied, as well as uh, uh, Nicole, is to make sure that this is owned not just by the uh, individual ministers, but perhaps by the higher authority uh, that's owned by the president's office and to really drive the all of country approach that Ambassador Rasul talked about. The other thing is when that's really hard, I think that another way to do it might be to um, go down to the local level where the sectors, it's smaller and, and in, in cities and in localities, you do get a sense that uh, the, these uh, localities can uh, make these sectors work more close together because it's easier to do. I think there are, there are two things I would say with regard to how you deal with multi-sectoral programming. One is it may not be that you have a single program that works in all of these sectors, but rather you have a series of programs that are focused on a single sector but better coordinated and complementary and synergistic, and that if you built that complementarity rather than stovepiping different endeavors, you would actually get the benefits of focused, specialized programs with the added value of covering different sectors. I think the other piece fundamentally is we simply have got to start involving stakeholders as partners in the design and implementation of projects. And we have failed on a number of metrics, whether it's with regard to uh, elevating the status of youth or whether it's with regard to closing gender gaps, because we're not involving the people we want to serve in the design of these projects and interventions. And we're not going to succeed until we do that. We, we cannot design things as well as they can be designed without asking people what they need and how to deliver it most effectively. Okay, Nicole, how about this question about uh, if you're not in the 30 countries, what, how, how should you think about the index? Sure. Um, we talked a little bit about this this morning, but thanks for bringing it up again. It's a really important question. Um, one of the things you said is that a number of these data points are available in many countries not included in the index. Um, in fact, there are probably some countries where maybe all of them were available, um, but we did make some choices to be strategic, to have good regional diversity as well as income level diversity in this first index. But to those countries that are not included, we hope that this, this index can be seen as a framework and a tool so that governments, young people, implementing organizations, corporations, any and all stakeholders can take it and run their own well-being analysis, see how they may compare um, and, and, and drive their own policies and programs and investments to better serve the interests of youth. So that's, uh, that's the quick answer. Thanks. Great. So if Anga, maybe we could start with you with, for, uh, from Anga and from Ambassador Rasul and from Laurie, this issue of, okay, how do we how do we take this and, and work in partnership and how to think about how, or maybe you might just reflect a little bit, how does your organization partner with others to, to, to confront their, or, or the opportunity and challenge of use? Maybe that may be another way to, to ask the question. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think uh, in development right now, there is a very big shift between uh, government to government and right now become society to society. And uh, I will back to my first points actually like, uh, it's really important to work with young people and consider young people as one of the stakeholders rather than put young people as a subject of development because as ambassador also said that young people are part of development. 
And I think the report, the index also shown a, uh, one of the result how, you know, working together uh, within uh, stakeholders can result to something really uh, effective for, for everyone while, uh, you know, uh, Hilton, I, IYF, and CSIS also consulted with young people to develop this index and um, like take, uh, taking into account all their voice to, to create this index. So, yeah, that's my, my point. Ambassador. Yeah, I think I've alluded to it, so very simply put, I think that the challenge is too big for us to wait until people conceptually change from seeing youth as a bulge to seeing youth as an opportunity. And I think it requires some leadership. And I think that the idea that we've said that we can't have the next generation um, that becomes just part of the problem, we've got to make the break. And sometimes governments may have to find its inducements um, in order to bring everyone to the party. Sometimes it is positive incentives, like investments that it puts down. Um, sometimes it is the, the regulatory framework and the budget um, that it has in order to make financial mm -hmm. institutions, for example, less risk averse. And so I think that we are going to have to do the ebb and flow between when we do inducements and when we do incentives um, in order, I think, to get a whole of government whole of society, but I also think that the international institutions need to reconceptualize themselves. They were born out of the preeminent international era when nations were being established, and they're holding all of those decision-making part, uh, participation me mechanisms and everything from an international era in an area, in an era when we are global. So we don't have global governance. We have globalization without global governance. And that is why I think we are still seeking the holy grail of integration. Laura, you have the, la Laura, you have the last word. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> um, actually, I think when you think about how to build partnerships, and for me, it all begins with looking at the outcomes you're trying to achieve. I think that's the best way to move forward and think about how to bring people together to solve a problem. What is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the actual outcome we want to see? And then what does each party bring with their own sort of true value to the equation? So what can a private company, you know, what can a public company do, I should say? What can a nonprofit do? One can, what can a youth group do? We each have value to bring, and it's different. And we should bring what we do best to look at all achieving the same outcome. I think when you look at the outcome and then you work backward, I think that brings to mind um, clear priorities and it also brings to mind a clear path forward. So that's what I would encourage is, let's decide what the outcome we want to see is, let's each get out of each other's way and not be redundant, but all bring our unique value to address that outcome. And, um, and we have great examples of doing that in many places around the world. I agree, it's often best to start local because you can see something, test it, find out how it's working, and then you can scale it. So um, focus on the outcome, start local, and then scale. Thank you very much. Nicole, congratulations. This is a great achievement, and I want to thank our partners, IYF and, and Hilton Worldwide. Thank you both very much. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to the panel. Please join me in thanking the panel.